What do you think the last thing you'll ever do will be? An odd question, I know. There's no way you could possibly know when it's the last time that you'll do something. For some, it could be during a very high point in life, and for some, it could be the opposite. One thing's for sure though, everyone will have a final moment, and due to modern technology, everyone will also have a final image. All final images aren't necessarily very unnerving though. Most are just sad, not very dark at all. However, there are definitely some that harbor some pretty distressing context. Today, I've chosen yet again to cover some of these images like I did around 11 months ago. Follow my social media link below, and I hope you enjoy this one. Just 52 miles northeast of Portland, Oregon in the Pacific Northwest region of the United States lies Mount St. Helens, a beautiful volcano that's been explored by people for hundreds of years, with the mountain holding some pretty serious significance to the Cowlitz and Yakama tribes in the area. It's also very tall, with its highest point being 8,363 feet or 2,549 meters. Because of its well-known nature, a lot of people have gone to the mountain to take pictures and document it for themselves, and usually this posed no real issues. However, many people probably know Mount St. Helens for much more infamous reasons than anything I've described so far. A volcano erupted with the shattering strength of a hydrogen bomb, flattening forests like kindling and searing the life out of a hundred square miles of timberland. Here we see a photo that seems pretty hard to distinguish at first. However, with closer inspection, we can see a road, trees, and some type of giant dark cloud rising above them. This photo was taken by Robert Landsberg, an at the time 48-year-old American photographer who had come to the mountain to capture its beauty. Unfortunately, this mysterious cloud was actually molten ash, caused by one of the most infamous natural disasters in U.S. history. Mount St. Helens, for 123 years it was dormant, but today the volcano exploded with a powerful force that turned daylight to dark. On May 18, 1980, Mount St. Helens would erupt, taking the lives of 57 people, destroying hundreds of homes, and even 185 miles of highway, among other things. It was initially triggered by an earthquake, and the eruption actually reduced the mountain's peak from 9,677 feet or 2,950 meters to the 8,363 feet or 2,549 meters mentioned before. Considering how close Landsberg was when he took this image, it's pretty clear that this would be his final resting place. Amazingly enough, because Landsberg knew that he wouldn't be able to survive, he chose to instead put all of his photography equipment in a backpack and lay on it in order to preserve the film for future researchers. Rest in peace to Robert Landsberg and all of the others taken by the Mount St. Helens eruption. The Stairway to Heaven is an illegal hike in Oahu, Hawaii that, according to WayfaringKiwi.com, takes exactly 3,922 steps or two to five hours to hike in completion. The reason it's illegal is due to issues over funding and cost disputes, but that hasn't stopped many people from sneaking in and performing the hike. For most, this would be a regular hiking experience. Tough, but fulfilling. However, for Dalen Poix, it wouldn't be the same. On February 27, 2015, Dalen would choose to take a bus and hike this infamous trail. He would take several pictures and text friends and family about his hike, and seemingly everything was going well despite the chance of him getting charged with criminal trespassing. But as time passed, Dalen was nowhere to be found. By that evening, his family officially launched a search with many different facilities including firefighters and the US Navy using their resources to scour the area in hopes of finding him. They searched for him until March 3rd wherein the efforts were called off. This of course didn't stop his family though. After continually checking every inch of the forest, the family began to look towards his text for further evidence of where exactly he could have ended up. This is when we stumble upon his current final photo. At first, it seems normal, but if you zoom in enough, you'll see a mysterious man crouched down in the bushes, presumably lurking in the distance behind Dalen. Many, including his family, believe that this man is likely the person who caused Dalen to disappear. As far as the news goes, this man has never come forward or been apprehended. As of now, eight years later, Aylan has still never been found. That being said, 
Everyone isn't so convinced that this incident involved any foul play despite that creepy final image that's been spread around for years. Reddit user DC Landry claims that as they were about three hours up their own trail in the same area, they heard a voice screaming for help down below them. After promptly calling 911, rescuers would later arrive to look. Because of this, they would continue up the trail, when suddenly they heard another scream saying, I'm down here. They screamed for the voice as it wasn't the same as any of the rescuers they encountered and called 911 again. Unfortunately, this person wasn't found, but it could be possible that this was Dalen. Another Reddit user also claims that the man in the background was their friend who did end up getting in contact with police and was simply passing by. It's also said that there was a pretty bad storm a couple weeks prior to his hike that caused the stairs to be even more dangerous. Regardless of how or why Dalen ended up missing, he didn't deserve to go out the way he did. If he is somehow alive, we can only hope that one day he returns home, but in the likely event that he's passed, rest in peace to Dalen Poir. November 29th, 1900. A seemingly normal day wherein the California Golden Bears and Stanford Cardinals would participate in what was known as the Big Game. That same day, a factory would open just across the street from the venue. Specifically, a factory by the San Francisco and Pacific Glassworks Company. Despite all the furnaces in the factory, only one was running as the factory was so new. Despite the fact that only one furnace was running, this furnace was filled with 14 tons of molten glass at 1650 degrees Celsius or 3002 degrees Fahrenheit. Usually this wouldn't be a problem, but like I said, this was the day of the big game. Because of that, there were a ton of people trying to get into the game, many of which couldn't afford or didn't want to pay the admission fee of $1. That might sound like nothing, but remember, this is 1900, so this is actually equivalent to about a $40 ticket now. That probably sounds a lot more reasonable. What these people did next may not sound as reasonable though. Many of them still wanted to see the game, and since obviously they couldn't just watch it on TV, they decided to go across the street to the new glass factory and climb up on the roof. This wasn't just a few people, but hundreds, as you can clearly see in this image that was taken at the time. The workers in the factory tried to warn the police as the entire peak of the roof had a ventilator, which wouldn't be able to hold the weight of all those people. Unfortunately, the police completely ignored the factory workers. Eventually, just 20 minutes after kickoff, the roof collapsed. A hundred people would immediately fall four stories to the factory floor, some fatally. Another 60 to 100 would fall directly on top of the furnace, which caused people's bodies to start boiling as the surface of the furnace itself was still 260 degrees Celsius or 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Several people also fell through pipes causing hot oil to spray everywhere, which also ignited burning people alive. After everything was said and done, 23 people's lives would be ended due to this disaster, all of which were male and the majority being children. Rest in peace to everyone who passed away in this disaster, and thank you to Mr. Lou Bird on Reddit for posting all of this info and the photos associated with it. Charles Hardin Buddy Holly was an extremely prominent pioneer in 1950s rock and roll who worked with figures like Elvis Presley, for example. His family was always interested in music, with Buddy playing the violin with his brothers in local talent shows. As he continued to pursue music and be inspired by many musicians including Hank Snow, Bob Willis, and Hank Williams, he would also make friends with Bob Montgomery in elementary school, who he would later make music with. After graduating high school, he would pursue music full-time and would be further inspired by seeing Elvis play live in Lubbock, Texas in 1955. Later, Buddy would open a show for Presley himself. Some of his most beloved songs over the course of his career would be That'll Be The Day, Not Fade Away, and Rave On to name a few. But alright, why am I talking about this well-known rock musician who was even ranked 13 in the top 100 artists of all time by Rolling Stone magazine? Well. It all has to do with this picture. On February 2nd, 1959, Ollie will be playing a show at the Surf Ballroom in Clear Lake, Iowa during his winter party dance tour. To avoid a bus ride and give them time to rest, they chose to use a Beechcraft Bonanza airplane to fly to their next venue from the Surf Ballroom. 
This could have been fine, however the pilot, Roger Peterson, wasn't fully qualified to fly by instruments only, which from my understanding means that he's only allowed to fly with perfect visibility as he can't fly accurately by using the actual tools in the plane like the gyroscope. As you probably guessed, he was forced to fly in inclement weather, which isn't clear visibility at all. We interrupt this program for a special news bulletin. Three young singers who soared to the heights of show business on the current rock and roll craze were killed today in the crash of a light plane in an Iowa snow flurry. The singers were identified as Richie Vallon, 17, Buddy Holly, 22, and J.P. Richardson, known professionally as the Big Bopper. The pilot, Roger Peterson of Clear Lake, Iowa, was also killed. The three singers had appeared at the Surf Ballroom in Clear Lake, Iowa last night and were on their way to Fargo, North Dakota. After 1 a.m. on February 3rd, 1959, the aircraft would crash into a cornfield five miles northwest of Mason City, taking the lives of everyone on board. Rest in peace to Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, J.P. Richardson, and Roger Peterson. On August 12, 2000, a submarine in the Russian Navy called the Kursk would be participating in a naval exercise in the Barents Sea. It was a massive submarine with nine compartments that could easily hold over a hundred people. This submarine in particular was said to be unsinkable as well, even being purported to be able to take a direct hit from a torpedo. The submarine was supposed to be conducting a training exercise in which it launched two dummy torpedoes at a battle cruiser. At 11.29, the crew loaded the first torpedo, and right after, seismic detectors would notice an event at a level of a 1.5 on the Richter scale. An explosion. At first, nothing was thought of it as others in the area assumed it was just a part of the exercise. One crew did report it, but was ignored. However, just 2 minutes and 14 seconds later, a second event would occur that was 250 times larger, at a 4.2 on the Richter scale. The explosion was so large that it was equivalent to 2-3 to three tons of TNT. Based on seismic data, the first explosion managed to sink the submarine down 354 feet or 108 meters to the sea floor before the second one occurred, showing just how powerful even the initial explosion would have been to those inside. Initial rescue efforts were unsuccessful, with the Kursk not even being discovered until the 14th. The event was initially downplayed by the Navy, with some even saying that the exercise had actually gone well and been a success, and others saying there were simply minor technical difficulties on the Kursk. The weather also didn't help, causing the rescue crews to be unable to perform nearly as well for two days. There were also several failed attempts to attach a diving belt to the sub and a rescue vessel onto an escape hatch. Even other countries had attempted to get involved and help, but all of their services were refused until five days after the incident when help would finally be accepted from the British and Norwegian governments. It would take until August 21st, nine days after the incident, for them to officially declare the entire crew of 118 people deceased. As tragic as this whole thing is, you're probably wondering what the crew on the ship actually went through, especially because of the fact that nobody lived to tell the tale. The first explosion was caused by a torpedo malfunction, but due to the structural integrity of the Kursk, the sub only got damaged and caught fire in certain areas, but didn't actually get punctured at all. This caused people to go into safety protocols, sealing pressurized doors on the outside of their individual sections in order to prevent any flooding. As they tried to direct the sub to the surface, the fire would catch other torpedoes and cause the second much larger explosion, taking the lives of everyone in the front half. At this point, only 23 people were able to survive, one of those being a man named Lieutenant Captain Dmitry Kolesnikov, who was given orders to serve on the Kursk, a job that he was very proud of. During the period that they were attempting to survive, Dmitry would write two letters chronicling what was going on. The first letter talks about himself and the 22 other survivors moving into the ninth section of the submarine to survive and that they couldn't get to the surface. After this, the power would shut out, causing the temperature to drop in the ship while water also began to pool in. At this time, Dmitry decided to write another letter in the dark, pictured here. It reads, Dear Olga, I love you. Don't be too upset. Say hi for me to initials and to all mine. It's dark here to write, but I'll try by feel. It seems like there are no chances. 10 to 20%. Let's hope at least someone will read this. Here's the list of personnel from the other sections who are now in the ninth and will attempt to get out. Regards to everybody, no need to despair, Kolesnikov. Not long after this, Kolesnikov and the rest of the remaining 22 would pass away. Rest in peace to all 118 people involved in the Kursk submarine incident. 
On August 12, 1985, Tokyo Flight 123 would take off at 6.12 p.m. Just 12 minutes later, the airplane would experience rapid decompression, severing all four hydraulic lines, unsealing and ultimately losing the vertical stabilizer, and damaging other parts of the plane. All maneuvers attempted by the pilots basically produced no response. As the plane eventually degraded into a complete loss of control, the pilots continued to do their best to fight it for over 30 minutes, which is an insanely difficult task. Eventually, at around 6.56 p.m., the aircraft would finally crash, hitting several different locations and flipping over before finally stopping in a state forest in the Gunma Prefecture. Despite being notified of the crash around 20 minutes after impact, the nearby Yokota Air Base was never called to help by the Japanese government, even though they had a helicopter to fly. Another helicopter would see the wreckage after nightfall, and it wouldn't be until the next morning that rescue teams would finally check the damage. Out of the 524 people on board, only four would survive. One of the survivors named Yumi Ochiai said that there were other survivors making noise, but overnight that died down. Had rescue efforts not been delayed, it's possible that there could have been even more survivors. During the investigation of the wreckage though, there was something else that was found. This image, which shows people presumably putting on their oxygen masks as the plane was decompressing. Rest in peace to all of the lives lost on Flight 123. This next one is completely credited to Pixels After Dark, who just happened to upload a video on this subject as I was working on this script which made me want to cover it. Check his video out after you watch this one as he covers the case in much more detail and it's a very well made video. That being said, the Appalachian Trail is an over 2,190 mile or 3,524 kilometer trail that runs from Georgia all the way to Maine. This daunting and extremely popular trail hosts thousands upon thousands of hikers each year, with over 20,000 completions of the trail having been recorded since 1936. Due to its popularity, 66-year-old Jerry Largay will begin to hike the trail with her husband and her friend Jane Lee on April 13, 2013. Her husband will provide supplies to the other two, with her friend accompanying her on the hike itself. They cleared over a thousand miles or 1,609 kilometers of the trail over the course of a few months and everything was seeming great. Unfortunately, Jane had to abandon the trip due to a family emergency and after some thinking, Jerry decided to continue the trip with her husband meeting her more often along the way. Other hikers would help her along the way, with a photo eventually being taken of Jerry as a show of how far they'd gotten. This photo would end up infamous, however. As Jerry was traveling down the trail towards the Route 27 crossing, she suddenly went missing. Over 1,200 people a year are reported missing on the trail, but only 200 have actually been recorded as deceased in nearly 90 years. Most are actually found within the first day or two. With Jerry though, this wasn't the case at all. As rescue teams continued to comb the area day by day, she would remain unfound. Eventually, the search parties were called off, but authorities continued to investigate the disappearance, with foul play being suspected as she was a very experienced hiker. Theories would pervade the online landscape about the situation over the next two years, until October 14, 2015. A contractor had to perform a mandatory forestry survey on Navy land, and found an abandoned campsite with personal items, a tent, and inside, a sleeping bag that still felt occupied. He took out the bag, finding the skull of Jerry poking out of it. Weirdly enough, the tent and items were right in the perimeter of the search party, even being reported to be only a hundred feet away from them at some point. This seems suspicious at first, but on Jerry's phone we see the true cause of what happened. At first, she sent a series of texts to her husband stating that she had gotten lost after going off of the trail to go to the bathroom. Unfortunately, there was no service, so the text didn't send through. She would also send another the next day, telling her husband she had gotten even more off track and to call the police for help. Her friend Jane that began the hike with her said that she could get disoriented at times due to the strain of the hike, which likely means that after she left to go to the bathroom, she got mixed up and accidentally walked deeper into the woods. She also left several journal notes about her survival detailing her struggles and places that she attempted to travel to. Eventually, these notes would be towards her family and loved ones, with her final note telling whoever finds her body to immediately tell her husband and daughter so that they might get closure. An extremely unfortunate event that should have never happened. Rest in peace to Jerry Largay. <laughs> 